Welcome to the fourth session of the Write Your Magnificent Book webinar series. This one's all about publication options and if we just glance over our shoulder for a moment and look at where we've come, we've covered quite a lot. So the first session, I, we looked at how to get started and I shared with you some of the attitudes and the tools that will produce reliably powerful writing. In the second session, we were having a look at how to structure your book and your time. So I hope that you plotters and pantsers are getting into it, whether you're plug it, plugging away regularly or blitzing or, or flowing. In the third session, we looked at language mastery. We, we dived down that rabbit hole and blew the dust off some grammar rules. And this session, we're looking at those publishing options. And the pros and cons of traditional publishing, going with a publishing consultant and doing it all yourself. And we're going to also have a very good look at a lot of the little pieces of what's involved in publishing a book so that you know what to expect. So I hope you enjoy it. There's quite a lot of information in this session, so make sure you've got paper and pen handy and do the exercises. Okay, see you on the other side. Welcome to Write Your Magnificent Book, Tips and Techniques for Aspiring Authors, Session Number 4, Publication Options. So we'll just look first again at the exercises from last week. That was firstly to ask yourself why you write. Ask yourself who your writing serves. Mind map or cluster all the potential readers of your work. Number three, ask yourself why you read. Exercise four, moving into that language stuff. Convert formal language and abstract words and phrases into everyday language. Exercise five was to tell a friend or imagine telling a friend your message first. And this is if you've got something perhaps complicated or technical to explain and you want to get it into simpler language. You might give yourself the task of telling them in two minutes, then one minute, then six, then sorry, 30 seconds, then 15 seconds. Each time you'll crystallise your message a little bit further. Or imagine telling it to a child and then return to your document without stiffening up again back into that formal language. Exercise number six was to tighten your text by being more concise. These are all in that workbook. Number seven, identify the jargon and cliches you or people around you or in your industry use and find simple, authentic, everyday words you can use instead. Eight, convert passive to active voice. Nine, sentence fragments and run-on sentences. And ten, agreement, subject and verb, pronoun and noun. Exercise number 11 was misplaced or dangling modifiers. Number 12 was apostrophes, 13 colons and semicolons. 14, punctuation with parentheses and quotation marks. So that was that adventure down the rabbit hole of um, grammar and language and spelling and punctuation and so forth. And you remember in your workbook there were also some troublesome words and other bits and pieces and some writing um, tips. So now publication. Here we go. Gird your loins. Getting published is where the need for self-esteem and resilience really kicks in. Now, it's a balanced journey. You know, writing is a feminine process. It's inward, dreamy, creative, intuitive. The rewriting calls for that more masculine approach where we have to be objective and decisive. If you choose to self-publish, you definitely need your masculine traits. Succeeding out there calls for focus, strength, determination, those typically or traditionally male qualities. However, the feminine continues to play an important role because you've got to keep listening to your intuition. There be sharks out there. Probably realize that today the consciousness is have computer can produce book but can you distribute them it's all very well to have a book printed but you can find yourself ending up with boxes and boxes of books you know literally books are stored in your garage boxes 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 of books hidden under pretty cloths as makeshift coffee tables boxes of books supporting planks as makeshift bookshelves for other people's books so be clear about what you want to achieve and take responsibility for earning everything you need to know. So I am teasing insofar as you can, you don't need to print out bulk books anymore. We've got print on demand and other sorts of things that make small runs easier. But I am serious too. Just before I go into this sharks um, slide, for me, when I was pregnant, all of my focus was, my attention, my focus was on giving birth 
and I didn't really think about what would come after it, the breastfeeding and the sleeplessness and the relationship challenges and the managing the young child. It was just the birth. How could I get through the birth? And you want to be careful with this um, journey that you're not just focused on producing the book, producing the book, because there's a mass that comes after that, which is the bigger job, really, which is the marketing and the sales. So the sharks, they're circling. There will be plenty of people out there who will say, tell you that writing a book gives you credibility, you know, and if you do our program, you can be a best-selling author guaranteed and just follow our how to write a book in seven days technique and then buy our how to get published program, etc. So there's a lot of problem um, promises out there and there's also a lot of sharks. So you want to be very, very careful. If there are two things you take away from this particular session, they need to be these two. Know thyself and do thy research. Be very clear on what your goals and values are and do your research. Don't buy anything that you are told up front without being really clear about it yourself. So let's get clear in a bit of language. A printer is paid for taking a set of files and turning them into as many books as you wish to print. The publisher takes on the financial risk of producing, marketing and distributing your book and pays you a percentage of the revenue. But do be aware that these days you are doing, they expect you to do most of the um, marketing and publicity yourself. A distributor represents you to a bookstore and for this service takes a significant percentage of the retail price of your book. Some play several roles. So publishing options. We've got traditional publishers, the very large ones that everyone knows the names of. Traditional publishers, the smaller ones and the boutique ones. The vanity publishers, co-publishing services and self-publishing. These are your options. And each one comes with its own set of pros and cons. There are apparently something like 440 publishers Publishing houses in Australia, most of these are small boutique publishers dealing with niche markets. The big five that everyone is aware of are Hachette Group, HarperCollins, Macmillan Publishers, Penguin and Random House, so it used to be the big six but they've combined, and Simon and & Schuster. These large houses have multiple publishing divisions that focus on particular genres, so you might find inside your book uh, when you look for the publisher that they've got a different name and you'll find that that's a division of one of those big five. So they have, they appear, there appear to be a lot more publishing companies out there than there are, in a sense. Um, books like the Australian Writers Marketplace give lists of the, all these publishers. Now there's an, another category of publisher. Trade is the general public books distributing through bookstores and retail outlets, your general fiction and non-fiction. Text are educational books that are distributed primarily through universities, colleges, schools and specialist bookstores. Scholarly and professional publishers deal with very specialised books targeting very specific markets. And then there are e-publishers who only promote, produce e-books. So the book trade consists of all of these categories. Pros and cons, let's have a look at each of them of traditional publishers. So the pros are that they're very experienced in production, marketing and publicity. They're, they have established distribution networks and clear contracts. They'll pay you a percentage of sales, known as a royalty. The big ones pay in advance against future royalties. And, and um, so therefore you don't get royalties until, if they've given you an advance, it might be $2,000, $5,000, $10,000. If you're very famous, it could be a million, right? So you won't get future royalties until you've earned that advance. The Australian Society of Authors recommends that the royalty be 10% of net retail price rather than of wholesale price. The wholesale price might be $12 and your net retail um, might be 20 So clearly net retail is better. Um, traditional publishers are genuinely seeking good material. Um, and just to note that the smaller companies have smaller budgets and smaller networks. The publisher bears the risk, but they often don't accept unsolicited manuscripts. When they do, it might be one to three per year out of as many as 100 manuscripts a week being um, sent into them. And that's known as the slush pile. Isn't that lovely? 
Going with a traditional publisher means that you lose control of, over your project, right? You're allocated an editor, a designer, a marketing department, so there are lots more opinions and decisions, etc., than, than you're able to make. It means you get a smaller percentage of revenue, of course. And you still have to do most of the marketing and publicity, especially if you're an unknown. Um, often you get a catalogue listing only. Just got a little story to share with you. I was at an event being run by a large publishing house in the uh, uh, Mind, Body, Spirit arena. And they had opened a new division that offered a self-publishing service or a, a publishing service, I should say. Um, and the CEO of this traditional publisher stood up the front in front of these hundreds of aspiring authors and told them, I recommend that you not submit your book to us, but instead you self-publish it yourself using our service, uh, for which you might be paying $8,000 or something. And we will watch your stats as you go, and when you show that you're getting good results, we'll pick you up. So I just thought, what balls, you know? What they're basically doing is they're no longer taking a risk on a new author, and what they're saying is you take the risk, you spend the money up front, and when it, you have shown us that you're going to do well, when there's no more risk, we'll take you on and we'll take most of the profit. So, you know, I think that's a bit, bit shonky, but that's sort of the reality of the world that we're in these days. Now, the practical reality is big marketing budgets are spent on the big names, and some of those small publishing houses don't pay in advance at all. So... How approach publishers? There are a few ways. One is you can do it yourself. Another is you can go through a literary agent and another is you can, you can uh, approach a manuscript assessment agency first. So let's go through all of those. So if you're doing it yourself, you want to research first. So check the submission guidelines on their websites, the websites of the companies you want to approach and comply. Match their requirements. Do not try to be the exception. One thing publishers can't stand is receiving manuscripts that don't fit their market. For example, sending fantasy novels for kids to a publisher that only does non-fiction for adults or something like that. So you've got to really read those submission guidelines. Um, sometimes also they prefer a phone call query first. Sometimes they virtually forbid phone contact. They just want you to refer to their website for submission guidelines. Often their site will announce they are not accepting unsolicited works at present. You often have to have a literary agent to attract the attention of a traditional publisher. It can take six weeks to six months to get a reply. Staff turnover can trip you up as priorities change. For example, one editor loves your manuscript but leaves the company before doing anything with it. And the next editor has different priorities so your project is returned or shelved. So if you're unsolicited, you must jump through their hoops and do exactly what they say or you'll disqualify yourself. Pan Macmillan has something called Manuscript Monday. If you submit the first chapter of your manuscript plus synopsis electronically between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. every Monday, you'll have your work read within one month. Alan and Unwin have something they call the Friday Pitch, um, by which authors can submit that first chapter and synopsis each Friday. Penguin has what they call the Monthly Catch, where submissions are restricted to the first week of every month. Sounds good, but there are considerations about that. Uh, you know, it... it doesn't necessarily mean, um, mean that you're going to have a better bite at the cherry. And when they say they're not accepting unsolicited works at present, there are always exceptions in that they will always look at manuscripts, material from published authors, and from an agent or something that comes with a really good review may open a door that would be closed if you were part of the anonymous general public. Um, so generally what they're going to ask for is a covering letter, a synopsis, the first three chapters of your book, chapter breakdown of the whole book, character descriptions if you're writing fiction, author credentials, and a marketing rationale or plans. So they want to know what makes your projects unique. They will. There are sorry resources available to you, um, a book called A Decent Proposal that I highly recommend. I'll talk about that later. Another one called Self Publishing Made Simple and The Well-Fed Publisher and Writer's Marketplace. So I'll talk about more of those more as we go. And I also recommend that you join national writers organisations for industry information and legal advice and things like that. So the second option for approaching publishers is to go through a literary agent. They, these people represent writers to publishing companies and you've got to do that same research and jump through those same hoops. 
the pros are they understand the industry and its jargon. They've often worked for or as publishers themselves. They should have good negotiation skills and could negotiate a better deal or advance than a novice. If they love your work and champion you and are skillful, they'll help position you and strategize your career path. But they take a percentage of 10 to 15% and closer to 25% of foreign deals negotiated, and that, that percentage comes out of your 10%. All right? You need to be clear on that. And it can be as difficult to get an agent as a publisher. So manuscript assessment agencies. These can be useful, especially if you receive a positive report that you can include in your submission. Um, so that, that might catch the attention of a publisher or literary agent. But not necessarily. Publishers and agents often trust their judgment over these opinions unless they respect that particular agent or assessor. That, that this is still only the opinion of one person who may or may not be part of your target audience. So Ewan Mitchell, who wrote Soft Publishing Made Simple, shares the story that with his book, Feral Tracks, um, the, the advice he received from two senior publishing personnel was almost directly opposite to that of two reviewers who were part of his target audience. And I tend to opt for the target market feedback also. They'll also, of course, charge you several hundred dollars for the service. Famous rejections. Everybody knows about J.K. Rowling, but did you also know Dr. Zeus was, re was rejected, Stephen King, John Grisham, Anne Frank, Rudyard Kipling, Richard Bach. You know, there's a mass of names. They're very famous people. Um, and people who went on to sell, you know, millions of books. So, for example, Gertrude Stein submitted 22 poems, sorry, submitted poems for 22 years before having one accepted. The Princess Diaries by Meg Cabot was rejected multiple times before becoming a major film. Best-selling author Zane Grey self-published after receiving dozens of rejections. Pearl Buck was rejected by all but one publisher in New York. Richard Hooker, who wrote the book that inspired the MASH series and film, was rejected 21 times. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig was rejected 121 times and is now read by millions. Chicken Soup for the Soul by Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen was rejected 134 times and is now a multi-million dollar bestseller with its own far-reaching brand. William Sarayun received 7,000 rejection slips before selling his first short story. The publisher comments that accompanied, rejection, that accompanied rejection slips about some of these works are often quite amusing as well. So many of our most widely lauded writers were widely rejected first. I was once at a writer's event. There was a panel of a publisher and a literary agent and somebody else. And the question was put to the publisher, how do you know if you're reading a bestseller? And she said, I get a tingle up my spine. And I remember thinking, what rubbish, what absolute rubbish. If that was the case, where was the tingle in the spine of all the publishers who rejected these authors, these books, you know, all of these books here? That's ridiculous. So... While there is something to being able to recognise good writing, it's not always the fact. And the bottom line is it's purely subjective. It's not about recognition of skill or what's going to be a bestseller. It's just, did you like it or not? Okay, now just a little story about Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen with Chicken Soup for the Soul. They went to the American Booksellers Association convention in Anaheim and walked the floor from booth to booth asking publishers if they'd be interested in their book. There were 4,000 booths there. And they reckon we don't think we hit every one of them. Well, obviously they didn't. They got 134 rejections. Finally, they went to the booth of Heath Communications, which became their publisher. They were a small company out of Deerfield Beach, Florida. Their primary focus was on the recovery world, so people getting over alcoholism or drug addiction or being codependent. They were slowly going out of business at the time because that whole market had become saturated. So they said they'd have a look at the manuscript. They read it on the way home on the plane, loved it, and said they would publish it. There was no advance. Vanity Publishers. So this is the original name for the publishing company a writer hires. Historically, it was considered vain to decide by yourself that your work merited publication rather than waiting for an external expert to decide that for you. These companies will publish anyone who pays their fees, no matter the quality of the writing or the value of the product. You still do your own marketing and distribution and they are unlikely to offer a very thorough editing service. So while it's been considered a negative with no kudos to the author to be published in that way, that view, that view is changing now obviously and it does offer anyone a chance. 
So they're now not called vanity presses, but publishing services or publishing consultants. They often will offer free seminars in which they inspire you with stories about their own or their client's success, and then they reveal their fee, which is usually significant, which they'll often radically discount in order to win customers. Sometimes these organisations take on the editing and book production for you, and sometimes they just give you tips and are more oriented towards marketing advice, especially by suggesting the internet and joint ventures. Check this option out very carefully. Without a doubt, some of them will be shonky and others will be genuine. Do your research. If you are considering one of these organisations, have a look at the kind of books they have produced and ensure the standard meets yours. Some are only in it for the money and some definitely love the book industry and want to be of service. So pros, you retain the profit after paying their fee. They're experienced in the production part of the process. Anyone has a chance to be published. Many genuine good companies. Sometimes they'll offer you partnership deals. So that means some of the costs are reduced. The cons, they're likely to inflate prices significantly. There are no guarantees um, regarding getting your books into bookstores, despite promises or claims. Anyone has a chance to be published. So this is a con as well as a pro, because it does mean a lot of un un poor quality material gets out there. Warnings abound about them. The shoddier companies allow projects that are riddled with errors or amateurish to go through to publication. They're in it for the money and the author bears the risk. So they exist on fees from producing the book rather than proceeds from the sale of the book. Right? That's significant because they're, 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 once they've been paid for producing it, they have no further interest in the book. And so they offer the writer no guarantees regarding getting the book into bookstores and they usually don't have anything much to do with that part. The literature might say they will assist you with marketing, but it usually just means listing a book in a trade catalogue or perhaps on a website that might not even get much traffic. If you've ever come across authors wanted ads, they're usually from vanity presses, right? So be very careful. But it's also the case that your traditional publisher will, might do as little as list your book on a catalogue and not do much more marketing themselves either. Self-publishing. So then there's the self-publishing option where the writer takes responsibility for the whole adventure. So that's the production, the book design, sourcing the printer, etc. The marketing, the brochures and other literature, the um, SEO uh, and other internet marketing, publicity, seeking interviews and reviews in traditional media, social media activity, admin. So that's regarding production of your book, regarding your website, regarding running your business, your sales, so packaging and posting your books, banking, invoicing. Creating new products, so that might be audiobooks, ebooks, online courses, free reports, um, promotions and events, so your book launch, signings, talks and workshops, your distributions, you might be cold calling, you've got to work out contracts, etc. So there's masses of stuff to manage. The pros of self-publishing uh, self are that you have complete control of your project and you can do it exactly as you want to. You are much more flexible than an organisation and can produce results faster, change strategy approach, or change your strategy or approach as rapidly and as often as you choose. All the profit and rewards are yours. And as the writer, you are much more committed to the product than a publisher would be. Okay, the publisher might cut their losses and move on if the book is not selling well. Apparently you have as little as six weeks to make an impact before stores can can decide they won't bother to reorder. And if they don't, distributors and publishers lose interest too. So the cons are that you pay for everything. You bear all the risk and wear all the consequences. There has been stigma, although it's much less now. You've got the bird, that burden of managing all the production, um, the distribution, the marketing, the everything. All, right? all those decisions are yours. There's a steep learning curve. Some booksellers resist with good reason because they've been presented with shoddy work. And the success rate is apparently less than 1% of self-published authors. So it is something to be very careful of. I don't know how accurate and reliable that figure is, though. Here is a list of famous self-published authors, though, to um, brighten the picture up. From the 1600s, when the first printing press was produced, right through today, there have been a whole lot of people who've achieved great success with self-publishing initially. And remember too, there is a distinction between good writing and writing that sells well. 
So you've got your literary fiction. Sometimes it might sell very few and have won literary awards and all sorts of things and yet not take the world by storm compared to popular fiction that might not be written as well and yet become an international mega seller, all right? So Fifty Shades of Grey is an example of that. And perhaps the erotic component helped with the sales there, but I gather the writing is, is really very ordinary and yet it's done massive sales. So it's, it's impossible to predict. How to generate sales? So word of mouth is the best way. In other words, writing a good enough book that people tell others about it. It's not just your word of mouth. Um, events such as book signings, speaking gigs, etc. Publicity via traditional media. Radio, TV, magazine, newspaper, interviews, editorial, book reviews, advertisements. Do you hire a publicist? You've got to be very careful there. They have fees. They'll often make claims. But there are no guarantees. They cannot promise you'll get onto a show or, or whatever because the shows themselves can't promise that. Things change at the last minute when news comes in. Publicity versus social media. 40 exposures a month to be seen or emerge from the crowd is what it takes. Affiliates. Um, who promote your book to their lists for a commission. So you can go to sites like ClickBank and Commission Junction and um, these people, these affiliates, will, you know, some people make their entire income just from promoting other people's products to their lists. Um, and then you've got pre-sales. So that's where you might, if you've got a good fan base or a good database, you might approach those people and offer them a special deal for a pre-launch price of your book or you might create targeted collaborations for example um, aligned companies that have products or services that are complementary they might be interested in purchasing large quantities of your book at a special pre-launch price and if you sell those copies up front you can be launching with already several thousand sales under your belt. With the publicity there are also plenty of people who offer publicity courses so you don't need to hire a publicist uh, because you can basically do their courses and learn how to do that, a lot of that stuff yourself. How books become bestsellers? Firstly, your book has to be good. People have to resonate with it, you know. Um, they have to like the message, the characters. They've got to be able to relate. For example, strong female protagonist, crime, erotica, etc. Massive word of mouth referrals, you know, and that sometimes is being in the right place at the right time. Having a big database or following, so if those pre-sales that we were just talking about, or a publisher's global reach. Publicity campaigns, so whether you're doing it through the traditional media or the social media, um, as mentioned just before, these campaigns are designed to keep your book at the front of um, the audience's mind. Um, just so you know, also, a New York Times bestseller equate, to get on that list, that means you're selling about 300 books a day. The best seller um, usually relates to actually sales in the first week or so. Now in Australia we have a very small market compared to say the US. 5,000 sales is considered a best seller and, and not necessarily in a week but just even almost at all. So I did 5,000 sales in a year and when we had achieved 10,000 um, that was when we put that on the cover of the book. So some people have also said that timing can be relevant with your launch of your book. It's hard to predict because things can undermine that. But, you know, launching the book at a time where people are buying a lot of books, like at Christmas, could be good. There was a, a novel um, launched in 1886 that was released at Melbourne Cup with a picture of Melbourne and a horse image on the cover. Apparently that, that you know, became a multi-selling book. And I gather Tuesday is the best day to launch a new product, according to internet marketing. Then there are affiliates or JV partners who promote your book to the list for a commission, so that can be another way of extending your reach. And there is something called bestseller programs. Okay, best-selling author campaigns. So this is where you create joint ventures with various businesses that have big lists or databases, and they each promote your book launch to their lists and offer bonuses to those who purchase your book within a particular window of time, usually an hour or two, as in you purchase this book between midday and 2 p.m. on Thursday the 24th of July. If a significant number of people purchase your book inside that window, your book sales spike on Amazon and you're identified as a best-selling author. So this can be a very dodgy option in that people can ask you to buy their book for 99 cents on Amazon to spike their sales. And I, you know, that's another way of them doing it. They might even offer you the 99 cents to buy their book. 
Some people might buy their own book to boost their sales. I haven't used the uh, bestseller campaign. You know, it's an interesting question. Do you shoot yourself in the foot by not doing things like that? Let's have a look at the pros and cons. So you are a best seller if, you're, if you uh, do that, assuming it works, right? People are unlikely to know about your book unless you do some promotion since the market is so crowded and this is a way to start the process of being seen. The cons. Is your book a real bestseller or just the result of a slick marketing campaign, i.e. does engineering your success feel as worthwhile to you as natural organic word of mouth success? Will sales continue or dwindle away? So do your research, um, you know, first of all. Is the company sort of genuine? Are they, do they really have the list they're claiming? Ask questions. Do you want four hours of fame and, and bestseller state? Are you going to genuinely feel comfortable telling people your book is a bestseller if you did great sales for four hours and then they, they just bottomed out? Um, the book might have achieved the kickstart it needed to trigger strong ongoing sales or it might just, you know, peter away. So for me, I wondered whether I should have done it, whether I was, you know, being too sort of up myself wanting to just do word of mouth sales rather than doing that, engineering that success. The point was made that perhaps I'd shot myself in the foot, you know. And so I took this sort of moral high ground that I wasn't going to do bestseller campaigns because I wanted my book to succeed on its own merits. And... Later, someone said to me, I, you know, I did begin to wonder if I'd shot myself in the foot a bit. And, and people did make the comment to me, well, you know, if you think about big publishing companies with big budgets and so forth, they're putting a lot of effort into their marketing and exposure of the author. So maybe not necessarily asking people to buy your book and, and paying, giving them the money to buy it or, or, you know, avoiding the lower end of these kind of campaigns, but maybe just having that exposure to lots of people and inviting them to a publish at a certain to purchase at a certain time, maybe it's not so bad from the point of view of, you know, you everyone has to engineer their success to some extent. Don't be an airhead. Everyone wants to be the next JK Rowling and to sell millions. Most people believe they could be that undiscovered, you know, seam of gold. So be real. It can happen, but don't wait for it. As they say about enlightenment, chop wood and carry water before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water after enlightenment. Most writers have quite a bit of chopping and carrying before they hit start and if, if ever. So don't wear rose-coloured glasses, just stay in the business of doing. You might have heard this, you won't make any money as a writer. Nobody gets rich selling books, you know, images of the writer in the garret. There is truth in it. The average Australian author's income is $11,000 per annum. And that's why they have other streams of income like teaching, editing, speaking, other businesses, other jobs. Few exist on income from book sales. But magic happens, so get in action doing what you love. Many authors today are writing and publishing books, not so much because of their desire to write or be a writer, but because they are building their credibility as an expert in their field or they're seeking another stream of income. Many coaches, such as the key person of influence system, recommend writing a book for this exact purpose. So your book is then described as a glorified business card. And these authors are not looking to make money from book sales. You know, they'll frequently give their books away because their eyes on the business that might follow, such as consulting or coaching work, rather than on the 10 or 20 bucks they might make from the sale of the book. So the book might still be very good, but the book is not their focus. And many entrepreneurs want a product to sell from the back of the room when they give seminars, so that's really the whole purpose of the book. Um, and, of course, that it provides great passive income. Market research. A lot of these publication companies that work with you to publish a book will ask you, is there a need or a desire for your book in the market? A lot of the best-selling author organisations and, and publication companies and whatever will ask you, is there a need or desire for your book in the market? Now, this is, they'll say you, you shouldn't start writing until you find out if there is that demand. Um, now, since they mainly attract unknown individuals who've never written a book before, it's probably wise to recommend that you do some research in order to determine if there's a market for your book, all right? Or, or if it only is in your imagination. But there is this thing called ends values versus means values, all right? So ends values 
is what you want to get at the end, the money, the recognition, etc. It means values is what you want to get from the process of doing the thing, for example, pleasure and insights. And many people are writing primarily for means value, like the, the people who come to my writing courses are often writing for the joy, the creative expression, the satisfaction, and that's just as important, if not more so, than publishing success. So don't feel invalidated if you actually you know, want to enjoy the process and want to write the book whether there's a market for it or not. And don't, I'm not just trying to pull a book out in a weekend. As um, Howard Thurman says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people that have come alive. It's rather a gorgeous quote. Then again, um, that author I was telling about in the 1880s who was successful with his book, Fergus Hume, he, before he wrote the process, his book, it was very calculated, he asked a publisher what is selling at the moment and modelled on it. <laughs> so there you go. Now, fiction versus non-fiction, it is a very good idea to create a publishing plan. Whether you are writing fiction or non-fiction, if you're writing non-fiction, it's much easier to do because it's very easy to target your market and research your market. It can be harder to predict responses to fiction or to make plans before a book is written. If you're planning to approach um, traditional publishers, they will probably want to see at least a sample of your writing before signing you on. And so whether you're self-publishing or going with a uh, traditional publisher, it's worthwhile creating that publishing plan, having a marketing rationale. And it's just simply true that self-publishers need a reality check on what they're doing because they're frequently not in the um, industry. So you need to do that. Write your book in a weekend courses. So books that reflect means values take longer. Oops, typo. Um, take longer than a week or even a month to write because they take you on a journey. You research, you go deep inside yourself, you rewrite multiple times. You pay careful attention to language and sequence, making sure that each word, word counts. It's the difference between the slow cooking movement and junk food. If you read the acknowledgements page of many authors' books, you'll recognise a common phrase. And thank you to my long-suffering partner and children who patiently did without me for months or years while I wrote this book. So good writing is time-consuming, especially fiction and books that require a lot of research. Know thyself when it comes to making your decisions. Know your purpose, know your outcome, do your due diligence. Are you writing for pleasure or to produce a short run for family and friends or do you have your sights on larger national or international markets? If the latter, do you want to approach a traditional publisher, a publishing service or do it yourself? If you want the control and extra profits, are you prepared for all the work and all the drawbacks? So, time to write. Exercise for you. Publisher's proposal. Synopsis and three pictures. So write a synopsis of your book to send to a publisher, even if you're planning to self-publish, because it, these are important exercises that help you crystallise your thinking. You may already have done this in the previous sessions. Write a seven-word pitch, which is describing the type of book or genre that you're working in. So for example, that might be something like this, and I'm now reading from A Decent Proposal by Rhonda Whitman and Sheila Hollingworth. Uh, my book is a modern-day fantasy thriller, or memoirs of a Canberra prostitute, or collection of puns, jokes and wisecracks, or it's a working holiday guide to Europe, or it's a romantic saga set in the 1890s, or it's a biographical account of life under Pinochet's rule. Write a 25-word pitch, which is explaining what your book is about in more detail. So this, the pitch for this particular book is a how-to for writers wanting to secure a book contract, but who have little understanding of how to approach publishers with a convincing book proposal. Or it could be an anthology of 20 real-life business success stories for everyone who has dreamt of shedding the corporate shackles and starting their own business. And those two were 24 and 25 words. Um, or it could be two families are thrown together after the mysterious double suicide of their daughters. Together they search the Australian outback for answers. So that's 20 words or an historic novel exploring the tempestuous relationship between Mary Queen of Scots and the Earth, Earl of Bothwell, as seen through a courtier's eyes, 24 words. Then write a 70 to 100 word pitch, which is an overview of the themes and the storyline, the main points in that storyline. So a non-fiction example, book proposals are becoming an increasingly effective way for writers to sell their manuscript to Australian publishers. 
Many emerging authors are often so involved in their writing they fail to understand the importance of presenting their book concept as a convincing and professional business package. A decent proposal is a how-to guide which takes writers on an instructional tour of how to develop a solid yet exciting book proposal. It features step-by-step -step instructions for developing a winning proposal and provides templates for proposals in popular genres. So that's, I mean, that's 86 words. Fiction example, Mary Stewart returns to Scotland as a 14-year-old widow to assume her rightful position as Queen of Scots at a time when England and Scotland are on the verge of civil war. She soon falls under the spell of the dashing Earl of Bothwell and their clandestine relationship blossoms, much to the fury of her ambitious courtiers and throne-hungry uncles. Mary and Bothwell's love flourishes, however only Mary's maid, the shy Charlotte Lester, is privy to what goes on behind the royal bedroom doors. Charlotte stays loyal to her mistress until that fateful day when the executioner's blade ends Mary's short life. Only then is Charlotte free to tell the true story of their love affair. And that one is 119 words. So have a go at a publisher's proposal also. So that's a co uh, the covering letter this time. One page maximum, be succinct. Introduce your book idea and why you think it has merit, why there will be a demand for it and how it is unique. Explain why you have the background, credentials or skill to have written it. Make sure you use the publisher's correct name, titles, spelling, etc. Don't make inappropriate claims or promises either. Um, here's a little bit of an example. Dear Robin, further to our telephone discussion on Monday, here is our book proposal for a decent proposal. Our book is a how-to for writers wanting to screw a book contract but who have little understanding of how to approach publishers with a convincing book proposal. In contrast to other books on the market, ours is a highly practical, cartoon illustrated, most importantly Australian focused. So what you're offering, it's your pitch number two, it's a short hook. While our credentials are detailed within this proposal, we believe we are the team to write this book for two compelling reasons. Firstly, Rhonda has considerable experience and knowledge about the marketing of writing based on her experience compiling the Australian Writers Marketplace and her workshop presentations on this subject, while Sheila is a freelance writer and cartoonist. Secondly, we both have a strong background in freelance writing across a broad range of genres and disciplines. So that's the who you are. Our proposal includes the following information about the author's comprehensive synopsis, including a concept statement, market potential, chapter outline, sample cartoons and a stamp self-addressed envelope. As much of the content is derived from workshops and masterclasses presented by Rhonda, we believe the book contact would be, content could be completed within two months of signing a contract. Our book proposal is under consideration by other writers. So just note there that two things. One is that um, you don't necessarily have to have already finished the whole book when you approach the publisher. You might have just written the first few chapters and have an outline. But you do need to have that sense of when you can finish. And it's a, a courtesy to let the publisher know that you are... Um, doing what's called multiple submissions, so you're sending to multiple publishers at once. We look forward to hearing from you to discuss publication of our book. A stamped self-addressed envelope is enclosed yours sincerely. And then your full contact details. A word about copyright. Ideas are not copyright, only the written work is copyright, unless a particular agreement is made, for example, a commissioned book, um, in which case the... the, the um, Commissioner is giving you the ideas to write out, but then there would be a written agreement. Um, some people think they need to post copies to themselves to prove their, their own copyright or register copies somewhere or something. You don't need to do any of that. Just put the copyright symbol and your name and date on the book. The copyright symbol basically just declares to the world that you know that your book is, um, is copyright. When you're negotiating with publishers, be very careful about which rights you sign away. Always hold as many rights as you can. So the rights include digital rights, audio rights, screen adaptations, foreign rights, serialisation, all sorts of things. Publishers own the ISBN or copyright for the term of the agreement. Um, a publishing service should not own that ISBN or copyright. You should be owning it as a self-publisher, even though you're using their service. Little story, I'm having an experience at the moment where someone approached me to collaborate. She had a concept. She wanted me to write the book based on her concept. She did not commission me. It was a 50-50 deal. Her brand and workshop she created was her 50% input and the, this concept and my 50% was the writing of the book. 
into the business. And, um, and then we would have 50% share revenue on the other side of things, sharing of the workshops and the books, the book um, revenue. So we had that working agreement. I wrote the book based on that working agreement. And then, um, and I made a bit of a, a, a critical error. Um, at the time that I wrote it, I was flattered that she had approached me. She appeared to be very successful in business. And um, I was sort of putting myself down by comparison with her. And so I wrote copyright Lily on Grace and her name, which I should not have done because I was actually the one to hold the copyright on the book while she held the copyright on her workshop and her brand. She held that IP. So um, having, having realised, I communicated this and suggested that it should, because the book was actually becoming part of my body of work as an author, not part of hers. She's not an author. So I suggested it should be by Lilian Grace in collaboration with. She objected but finally agreed. However, increasingly um, things got more difficult and uh, the book is now sitting with lawyers. So hopefully we will resolve that very soon. Self-publishing. Make sure if you're self-publishing you hire an editor. Don't ever assume you can go to print without hiring. Having another set of knowledgeable eyes looking at your work and checking for errors. We all have blind spots. Find an editor who can do a structural edit, that is looking at the book's sequence, the flow of ideas, clarity, logic, consistency, fluency, impact, all of that sort of thing, and a line edit, which is checking for grammar, spelling and punctuation. Now, book layout is another consideration. There are all sorts of decisions to make. So you've got um, fonts to decide for your text and your chapter headings. You've got point size of text, where the page number goes, top, bottom, centred, left, right, typesetting. You've got something called widows and orphans. Widows are loan words from the end of a paragraph that start a new page, and orphans are the first line of a paragraph that occurs at the bottom of a page while the rest continues on the next page. It's very messy. So they usually, um, typesetters usually shrink and expand everything to make it fit aesthetically on the page. Your cover art, are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to hire an artist? Are you going to use a book cover service or an app? It has to stand out to compete against thousands of others. Um, you know, have, have a look in a bookstore. Your cover has to be eye-catching and clear. Beware of using images from the internet. You can be sued if they're not public domain or if you haven't purchased them. Um, check out Creative Commons and VisualHunt.com um, and also when you're laying out graphics inside um, the book, hire an expert to manage all of that. So if you're feeling like screaming help, um, some self-publishers manage the entire project themselves, some outsource and hire experts to help them with the stuff they can't or don't want to do. So you can hire people to do just certain parts of the job while you manage the whole project and do the parts you want to do. Or you can hire a company to manage the whole project, you know, a, a publishing service. Some of these are excellent, some are dodgy. Speak to a few before you choose. Look at samples of their work. Do they come recommended? Do you like them? Now, at the lower end, a publishing service might charge you $3,000 to design and typeset your book um, and organise most of the administrative requirements. I'm going to talk about those on the next slide and liaise with printers and all that, you should always retain all the rights and you'll receive a handful of books, 10 or so books. At the higher end, you might be charged 7000 or so for those services, plus editing an e-book version, upload to Amazon, social media setup and press release, author bio, cover blurb, connection to bookshops and libraries and a distributor. You again retain all rights and you might receive, say, 50 books for that price. An even higher price will include support while you write the book, such as a writing retreat. So let's look at that admin stuff. Your copyright statement, ISBN, which is the International Standard Book Number. You probably have seen this on the backs of books. It's 10 digits. You obtain it via a company called Thought Backer. You need a barcode for your book um, for sales purposes. And every book you have to have a approach the National Library for a cataloging number and category and you need to post a copy of your book to the National Book Deposit because it's a legal requirement. And there's more, so for example, example there's listing on sites like Title Page, which is how uh, booksellers find out about your book, in catalogues like Ingram. There's something called PLR and ELR to do with um, pub, um, libraries, I'll come to that. QR codes, um, which are um, is a machine-readable code 
consisting of an array of black and white squares typically used for storing URLs or other information for reading by the camera or smartphone. So if someone's got a smartphone, they can look at your QR and be taken to your website. And then there's the whole business of getting on Amazon and um, getting into libraries and um, permissions. So permissions meaning um, if you've got quotes or stuff from other books or pictures or whatever it is from other books, you need to acknowledge or, or seek permission to use them. Um, and apparently these days when you register a book, there is a new author item you have to check to avoid a beginner author called John Smith writing on the success of an established author called John Smith. Interesting stuff, huh? Self-publishing layout. You might have noticed when you open a book that there is something called the imprint page at the very beginning of the book, which lists the name and address of the publisher, the publication date, copyright statements. Um, that's the symbol and the date, plus a statement that might be something like the author has asserted his or her right under the Copyright Designs and Patents Act to be identified as the author of this work. You know, permission is required to copy it, or apart from fair dealing for review, da 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 da. Or it can't be lent, resold, hide out, all that kind of thing. Um, the National Library cataloguing information, the ISBN, and um, just be aware that unique numbers are required for paperhead, or paperback, audio, and ebook versions. And typesetting. Um, which font you've used is often on the imprint page identified there and cover art or artist is acknowledged. So when you are laying out your book, these are the, the um, pieces to consider. There's something called the formatter and that includes that imprint page we've just talked about, uh, your title page which is just basically a blank page that just says the name of the book and your name. Uh, testimonials can be included in the form matter, dedication, acknowledgements, introduction, an introduction that you might write or someone else might write, a preface or a forward, quotes, sometimes you, you'll notice a page with just a quote that relates to the book, At the contents page with all of your chapter headings, then the con main contents of the book obviously is the book itself and you've got to be aware of needing to address things like headers and footers or footnotes in that part of the book. Then the end matter after the main part of your story or content is finished includes perhaps about the author information, an afterword, a glossary if net relevant, references if you've had footnotes perhaps, the permissions we were talking about, index pages if your book is indexed for some non-fiction, bibliographies if it's a you know, more scholarly sort of work, appendices if you've got extra bits to add in, and sometimes the authors or publishers promotional material like where they promote courses and other books that they've got. And um, sometimes also the first chapter of a sequel is included in the end matter. The cover itself, there is the uh, artwork and the blurb to prepare. Proofreading. A proofreader is trained to look for errors. Even with my fairly eagle eye and constant rereads and rewriting, and many readers, including an editor and a proofreader, we've discovered typos right into our fourth print runs. After writing and rewriting numerous times, we are too close to our material to see it objectively or notice those errors. The blind spot is a real hazard. Hire an expert. So printer preparation. You've got to converse in printer speak. So they'll ask you what specs you know, your book has, and specs means specifications. So they're going to ask about GSM, which means paper thickness. It stands for grams per square metre. About the stock, which is the type of paper. For example, it, it might be newsprint or it might be this white glossy stuff. They'll ask about binding. Do you want what's called perfect binding, which is the usual type of book spine? Or saddle stitched, which is when the book is stapled, or case bound, which is hardcover or spiral. So spiral might be good for cookbooks, for instance. Um, they'll ask you about the size, and the, as in the area of the page, if you're going for like a coffee table book or, or a, um, you know, a, a normal paperback or whatever. So there are usually particular sizes for particular measurements, you know. Um, and whether you're colour or black and white. And just a word on colour or black and white, when we did the Mastery Club, when we had that first printed, we had 6,000 copies for $2,000.
recently, when, when a few years after that I had my first children's picture book printed, that one was about $6,000 for 1,000 copies of a children's picture book, and that is the cost of the full colour. So I don't know what the prices are these days, but just be aware of that. There are three types of printing. Offset printing, which is the traditional method of printing, where ink is transferred from plate or stone to a rubber surface and from there to paper. Digital printing via computer file and print on demand, which actually is a form of um, digital printing. There are advantages and disadvantages to each, of course. So the pros of traditional offset printing, it's cost effective, especially for large, vol large volumes. It's your best quality printing option. Oh, that was something I had to correct that I didn't see. Um, there's more choice of print materials, for example, range of paper, ink and finish options and colour accuracy. The cons are you've got to store a lot of books because you've bought a lot up front and it's a bigger outlay up front, therefore. Uh, a slower turnaround because it's a more unwieldy system. Um, so it takes them quite a long time to set up these plates. But once the plates are made, um, it means that you can, it's all set up so it's easy to then keep producing more of that same book. Um, but also once the plate is made up, emissions cannot be easily changed. And be aware also that the cost of a print run depends on the size and the number of pages. So you, they usually print about four pages on one sheet. Um, right, so there's all sorts of things to consider. And so, right, it's more difficult to customise print jobs because it's a more unwieldy process. Digital printing is very fast, it's great for low volumes. You can proof um, very easily, you know, getting, getting it emailed to you. It's best for quick and low cost short print runs. The cons are that you can't match offset printing for cost effectiveness of large volumes and you can't match offset for quality. Um, and, and I believe that colours can be difficult to adjust or predict because the colour of the image that's printed can be different to what you see on the computer monitor. So print on demand is digital printing um, where you're not getting a short run but you might be getting even one book at a time. So it's cheaper up front, especially if you only want one or a few copies at a time. It's good if you need galleys, which is a, a dummy of the book, a proof of the book, or for short run publishing and specialty markets. Um, to print small non-fiction projects like lectures or workshops, to create a recipe book, a family memoir, genealogy, to be able to produce the odd hard copy if you're mainly producing e-books. So for example, if you're just operating in EPUB, so e-publishing, um, but you've got the odd client who wants a hard copy book, then that's a way they, they can access that book. And to bring out-of-print books back into circulation, the cons are higher unit cost. They're actually very expensive printers. And many extra fees, you own, and you only get what you pay for. Now, what else? And it's an expensive option for shop distribution because if um, bookstores want your book in store, printing them out via print on demand when you're only printing a few at a time means that there's virtually no margin left in it for you. And obviously you won't get an advance from a print on demand company because they're really just a printer, not a publisher. So true self-publishing all rights remain with the writer who has full ownership and holds the ISBN. The author controls all aspects of publishing process, including cover art, print style and pricing. The author keeps all proceeds from sales after expenses. If it's dodgy, you, they may own the ISBN, giving the author limited claim on digital or electronic publishing rights. Your publishing choices are limited to the service package. They rarely provide a good editing service. The book may be poor quality or clearly self-published. It may be costly and leave you with few books to sell yourself. So it's an important question is what price do you have to pay the publisher for your books when you want to buy more stock? And there may be lots of extra fees, for example, marketing fees, distribution fees, and extra charges for non-template cover design. Um, so let me share with you a couple of horror stories, shall we say. Um, a woman who was a highly qualified writer, a PhD in, lecturer in, in literature, was inspired to write a book on self-esteem for youth. And when finding a publisher seemed too difficult, she signed up with one of those vanity presses kind of thing. In other words, a publishing service that was really only interested in getting her book produced. 
Um, so she completed a book, paid her fee, which was about a couple of grand, and received 30 copies of her book and the assurance that it was being placed on various catalogues and websites, including Amazon, this being the Vanity Press's base-level marketing and distribution effort on her behalf. When several months later hardly any copies had sold, this company approached the author and recommended that she purchase a marketing package um, and, and they would create a media campaign for her. This was presented in fairly compelling terms and the author agreed for a mere additional $8,000. Over a period of a year, her book sold only about 22 copies, and that cost her $10,000 with only 30 copies of her own to on sell. So that's a, um, you know, be, beware kind of a story for you. And another example um, that I'm aware of is another woman had, had a similar issue with a similar, I think it might even have been the same company, where her... Um, she discovered that they had taken ownership of her ISBN and her copyright, and so she had to wait for a period for that to expire before she could get it back. So you want to be very, very careful. So distribution when you're self-publishing. So distribution distributors are the people who get your book into stores. There are several large experienced companies that dominate the market and other more niche organisations. These have traditionally been biased against self-published authors, but no longer. So how it works is you pitch your book to the distributor, Oops, typo there. Um, again, if agreed, they send you a contract. They buy the books at a 65 or more percent uh, discount and pass 40% on to the bookseller. Um, and you provide books and some marketing information to them and their sales rep takes your books on his or her rounds along with a stack of other books. And your book gets there for one or more exposures. So once a month, the book rep is going out with their books, but your book might only be seen by that bookseller once because there's new stock every month, right? Um, so regarding the 40%, so the, if your book is $20, the bookseller will want to buy it for $12 perhaps. So that's that, that discount. So the distributor is going to buy it from you for more like $7 so that they make something before the bookseller gets their um, cut. All right, so it's very yummy. Um, it pays to be aware of all this stuff. Um, you can, there are something called fulfillment houses where, which will store books for you while if you're selling for yourself and you don't have a distributor, but then that's another fee you've got to pay as well. Uh, and just one other thing about distributors, they have a, um, a six-month lead time with their catalogue. So they will want, if they're going to stock your book or if they're going to promote your book, they will want to have the cover image and the, and the blurb about it six months before, you know, it's, it's needed um, in order to go into their catalogue. And also they will probably want to have some input into the cover art of the book because they want it to look good and sell well. Now, bookstores... If bookstore owners read and fall in love with your book, they will hand sell it, which means they'll recommend it to customers who ask for suggestions. If not, they'll probably only pay attention to it if it is the subject of great reviews or publicity or if customers start asking for it specifically. So they might be interested in the book, a book from an unknown author if they've got a philosophy of supporting local authors or if the subject is topical or it interests them or if, they've, if you've developed a good relationship with them. All right? Make sure your book is on the sites that booksellers go to when they're looking for a title, for example, title page. Now, stores purchase another typo. Hmm. Stores, see what I mean by proofing and editing? And I've already looked at this a million times. Stores purchase on consignment, which means they can return if there is no, um, if there are no sales. So the key to success is to build demand for your book first. There's no point rushing around getting books in stores if they don't sell because the booksellers will return them. So you want to build demand via publicity first. So people are going into the stores and asking for your book. Then orders from the stores will follow naturally. Now some authors do guerrilla marketing where once their book is in the store, they go into that store and they turn it face out so it's not spine out but face cover out so that it grabs more attention. Um, or they might get their friends friends to go buy the book or you know, think, have them make queries about it and things like that. I have been known also to go into libraries and leave my bookmark in um, books that are a similar type of book. And that's another form of guerrilla marketing, but it's not particularly effective, I'm sure. Um, okay, libraries. Specialist distributors serve the libraries market, so you need to approach them directly. 
Um, some general distributors will deal with them as well, as well though. Also consider giving talks in libraries, all right? So that can be a good way to get in front of people and that's usually the best marketing. Lending rights, PLR and ELR, publishing lending rights and educational lending rights. If you're interested in, um, if you're, sorry, if you're registered as a member with CAL, the Copyright Agency Limited, you receive a royalty every time your book is borrowed or photocopied in schools. In Australia, CAL provides the service of tracking those payments for you. They have something called CalDirect. This is an endangered species. Um, I won't go down that path right now, but there are all sorts of threats to author income. Internet presence. Um, of course, you do need an internet presence, a website or blog, social media presence, ebook and audiobook versions for Kindle and iPad sales on Amazon, etc. Reviews. These are very important. Aim to get book reviews on online sites like Amazon and some in hard copy publications, especially magazines, newsletters or journals that address your topic. Also seek reviews from readers and bloggers. All of these can be shared via your website and blog and e-newsletter, in social media, in the book itself and on promotional material. Remember, some people are going to love your book, some may hate it. Take it all with a grain of salt. Some will smile nicely when you come into the room and talk about something else, all right? So. <laughs> Graham Murphy is the Artistic Director of the Sydney Theatre Company and he says you must dismiss the good as well as the bad reviews if you want to dismiss the critics. Dr De Martini says take no credit, take no blame, just stay focused on chief aim. If you get elated or cocky or gloat about your good results, you're likely to attract a suitably humbling circumstance to balance you out as he teaches. So remain centred and committed to your greater purpose whether the feedback is positive or negative. An exercise for you. Book, jacket, bio. I want you to write a jacket pricey about yourself as author of this work. You know the kind of thing, so-and-so was born in, was is the author of, lives in, has three children and 17 cats, you know, that kind of thing. But I want you to go beyond that. I want you to allow yourself to take the world by storm. Be the winner of the Booker Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Have written an international bestseller. Divide your time between the Greek Isles and New York. Whatever takes your fancy, go for it. Make it up and have fun. And I forgot to say when we were going through this earlier to stop the slideshow so that you could do your, um, your exercises. So stop the slideshow and do this exercise. Dr. John Martini once approached Wayne Dyer and said, please advise me how can I become an international speaker? And Wayne Dyer said, introduce yourself as an international speaker. And John said, but I'm not. That's lying, isn't it? And Dr. Dim um, Wayne Dyer said, be a prophet. So prophesy the literary success you would like to experience. Use language to consciously transform your life. Or use language consciously to transform your life. May the sky be the limit. So now here's my experience with the Mastery Club for you. I had the idea floating around for some eight years before I started writing it. It was not a strong impulse, it was more of a whisper. The more I listened, the louder it got. Life had to give me a few swift kicks before I focused on writing it. For example, my son, I told you the story that he was being unproductive and then I decided to own the mirror and um, take my claws out of him and get focused on my own work and realised that I was procrastinating writing this book. And my sister, who was starting up a um, professional writing and editing course, um, and that, that also gave me a swift kick because I didn't want her to get to the finish line before me. Along the way, I dedicated two to three hours a day to writing and learnt more about trusting the story. Magic happened once I honoured my impulse and wrote. I read the book to my family and gained their enthusiastic support. My husband and I had been through a very difficult time maritally and this was a kind of a turning point in our relationship. It was like a, a new child that we both became committed to. Dr John Martini read the book at my request and volunteered the foreword. After reading the manuscript, a businessman I'd, I had not yet met or barely met um, gave me an hour of his time and, vol uh, and um, once a week because he felt guided to support me in realising this dream. So he literally got that message in meditation. And, and later on, that particular gentleman is the person who approached me to write the Champion Series. Um, so, and he funded uh, the two Champion Series books that I wrote, the one about Dr D. Martini called The Boy Who Barked and the one about Don Tolman called The Boy Who Found His Pulse. In September 2005, I sent my manuscript and pitch to the large traditional publisher I felt would be perfect. It was rejected, possibly unread. Many other large publishing companies were not accepting manuscripts from the authors at the time or their website said to try again in three months' time. 
I approached a literary agent who loved it, but when the first publisher she approached rejected it, she dropped the project. And in retrospect, I don't think she had signed me on, so she wasn't committed, so beware of that. Was she only going to sign me on if she was successful? That's dodgy. I approached three small publishing houses who all thought it was good but felt they weren't the right publisher for it. So that's about six rejections by now. I approached the book distributor I wanted because I was, you know, decision made to do it myself. They rejected me and referred me to a couple of vanity presses. One self-publishing service offered me a partnership deal but when my husband and I looked at the fine print we realised we could do most of it ourselves and retain the profits and control so we rejected them. Having been involved in the books and writing industry for years, I was not a complete novice, so I began serious thinking about marketing and sales. I hired a professional editor who was also a specialist in my content, paid about 1500 bucks. I catalogued my book as non-fiction, despite being fiction, to not attract unwanted literary criticism. Um, let me explain that. I knew that the book, because I was teaching through story, I knew the book was going to read too didactically for literary sort of fiction. And so I was, um, as a my vanity as a writer was coming into play here because I knew I could do better work as a, as a writer of literature, of, of fiction. Um, but the purpose here was to be educational. Uh, we modelled on Harry Potter's stock, which is, was called newsprint, that kind of paper, and their fonts to look like a bulk-selling trade paperback rather than a self-published book, which often have glossy bright white paper and big line breaks instead of um, for new paragraphs instead of indentations. If you look at Traditionally published books, they don't do the line break, they do the indentation for new paragraphs. I asked my 20-year-old niece to do the cover art, paid her about $1,500, um, the book being for youth, it was seemed fitting. We still had to decide cover layout, spine design, etc. My husband handled all graphics and typesetting of the book. I asked a writer friend to proofread, love her, but she did a shocking job, hire a professional. I befriended a local bookstore owner and put a mock-up of my book on his shelves to see how it would compare. Realised the title wasn't snappy enough and changed it. The subtitle, that was. Book layout was underway, blurb was being written, cover design was underway, testimonials were being sought to go in the book, forward was en route, imprint page was being sorted. So that's your publication date, copyright statement, cataloguing information, etc. Print quotes, $6,000 for 2,000 copies for my 250-page book. How are we going to pay for that? The businessman supporter suggested we seek sponsorship. That was a great idea. We offered half a page at the back of the book to any aligned business or individual purchasing 100 copies and a whole page to anyone buying 200 copies. We sold these books at a special pre-launch 50% off price. The pages we offered would not count as advertising. Despite the exposure, it was just a tangible thank you from us. We covered most of our first four print months in this way. Then we were at the printing stage, right? So we sought quotes from a few printers, including offshore. So sorry, this is just a bit more information about printing. With the latter, we felt that any um, gains in terms of money saved were lost in time delays and potential uh, language issues, you know, dealing with China. So we opted to buy Australian. We went with Griffith Press, who have been excellent. We considered print on demand, but felt it was too expensive per copy and wouldn't permit us to have a bookstore presence. When a marketer said we should have had a page in the book for our website and a tear-off or mail for info slip, we produced and inserted a bookmark in every copy with our website details and offering a freebie to encourage visitors to the website, that is. Manuscript, um, complete, book edited and proofread, file sent to a printer, nervous waiting period, proofs come back to be checked, last chance to pick errors or make corrections. We approved, more waiting, six proof copies arrived to our door, followed by 50 boxes, each containing 40 books. Storage challenge. Our website was being built at this time and now went live. More magic. Wendy is a woman who I met at my home education group. She turned up uh, with her son and when she heard what I was doing, offered to create a website for me for free. She was just setting up a new business for herself, making websites. I was very touched. She created the website, beautiful, did a beautiful job, and then disappeared. No longer attended the home education group, even though it appeared she'd come for that purpose and just coincidentally worked with me. It started to look like she it was almost like, a, you know, she had a karmic debt to me and she turned up out of the blue to 
to complete the debt and move on again. It was just so bizarre. So just like this absolute appearance disappearing act. Um, and there were more challenges. She'd created the website in code and obviously once we took it over, uh, we couldn't understand the code, so we had to have it all changed over into a content management system, which is basically in English. Book launch, so there are preparations, lots more to organise, invitations, venue hire, guest speakers, petty cash, receipts, assistance, refreshments, that's just some of it. And then the book launch event, so it's your big party, your assistance, your refreshments, I didn't, don't think I did a good job of editing this page. So 100 guests or so, we did good sales, we had a great buzz from that event. I'd had a friend tell me, a published author tell me, don't bother with a, um, a book launch, you'll just you know, be wasting your time and your money. But I reckon, nah, it's my party. I'm celebrating all the efforts so far and it is a great way to launch. We did great, great sales following that book launch. After that, now that I had copies, I was posting books out for review. Ask the reviewer before posting. Do not assume they will review when they receive your book. They receive many books. And I was fortunate in that I received glowing reviews and how you ask is literally email them or ring them. So you go looking at the, who does the book reviews, who's the editor or whatever of the publications and reviewers, uh, I mean um, magazines, etc. and then you just give them a call or email them. I met a publicist who was very enthusiastic. Oops, let me just go back on that one. Um, who was very enthusiastic and she gave me the impression she'd have me on morning TV within a couple of weeks. So I wasted a few you know, a couple of weeks feeling anxious about that. But nine months later, I had achieved all the book reviews and interviews that had occurred thus far and we parted ways. She'd done nothing. Now, so she, her fee was about three grand. Fortunately, she had agreed that I pay her 1500 up front and the latter, the, the balance uh, down the track. But by the time we got to down the track, I wasn't prepared to pay any more since she hadn't achieved anything. Um... Sometime later, I met another publicist, lovely fellow who saw my potential and wanted to help, and we became great friends. I appreciated his enthusiasm, but we had different views about how to present my story, so we called it quits. Publicity, just be aware again that the publicist cannot guarantee anything, all right? So, you know, it is a risk. But you can't do everything, and that might be the bit that you opt to outsource. Um, shameless self promotion, all right? So you just got to be out there doing it. Talks, interviews, you invest in yourself, you're door knocking bookstores, you're phoning libraries, you're doing radio interviews, TV interviews if you can get them. I was on Channel 31, which is um, community TV. Talks to service clubs and others, contacting schools, writing articles, sending out my own newsletter, right? Masses of, masses of stuff. Started a blog. So we had 2,000 sales at the six-month mark, so I reapproached my desired book distributor. They sent an agreement to me the same day. Submitted my book to the 2007 Independent Book Publisher Awards, and the Mastery Club was a bronze finalist in the youth fiction category, which was a great endorsement. I got stickers to affix to the book. Um, I do recommend sending your book to prizes and awards. Um, there are entry fees. It was about 80 US dollars to submit, and you've got to send books as well. I received beautiful testimonials and reviews. Um, kids were starting their own mastery clubs. By the end of the first year, our sales were at 5,000, technically making the mastery club an Australian bestseller. We added this to the cover design. I began to give more talks and short workshops. I developed a program based on the book that has been taught in Scotland, England, Bali, America and South Africa, as well as Australia. This meant lots more product development, the student program, plus facilitated training materials and webinars as I was training others and associated marketing, promotional literature, meetings, phone calls, seeking sponsorship, all sorts of stuff. So I became Wonder Woman. This was my husband's idea of a, a joke at my book launch of the Hidden Order, my sequel. So you've got to go out and buy your Wonder Woman or your Superman cosy at this point in time. Uh, foreign versions. I was approached by a publisher in Germany, though this fell through as she closed shop. The German ebook is on my site now, though she did finish the translation. And I had the book published in Mandarin by Oriental Press in 2010 for distribution through China, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan. 2,000 sold in the first six weeks, then sales plummeted. Why? I don't know. But I did have shonky agents. That's another story. A number of film producers have contacted me. I wrote a sequel and launched it in 2012 and then I began to crash. Why is another cause? Aside from overwhelm. Time for you to write again. Mind map your book launch. One branch, 
who you can invite, one branch, how you can promote this event, you're going to approach the media, one branch, who can be your guest speaker, it's great to have third party endorsement, one branch for, is there going to be a theme to your event, refreshments, invitation, what's your approach going to be, one branch for the logistics, who can help you, what will you need to do, um, pricing, signs, um, video, etc. Most book launches are a wine and cheese event at about 6pm in a weekday in a bookstore to attract journalists. I went with a Sunday afternoon. I wanted friends and family there. So act on your dreams. Learn from those who are experienced and trust your intuition. Be negative, i.e. realistic. My father has an extraordinary ability to uh, see what can go wrong with almost anything. I used to call him negative till I realised the value of being able to anticipate what could go wrong and prepare for it. Achieving your dreams calls for a balance of idealism, the dream or the vision, and realism, practical steps, strategies, and appropriate expectations. Be positive as well, therefore. Believe in yourself. Decide you're worth it. Take action. And remember that when you're feeling overwhelmed or frustrated, so hang on, here we go, persist despite rejection. Remember when you're feeling overwhelmed um, or frustrated, appreciate what you've achieved and focus on the, on the good stuff that's happening, right? Remember that if you love what you're doing, that love will translate into energy and enthusiasm and carry you through whatever lies ahead. So when I finally decided what to do, you know, to do what made my heart sing, magic happened, doors opened, and synchronicity played a part. And so that you don't get overly excited, shit happened, doors closed, there were lots of delays in mulberry bushes, you know, ran around the mulberry bush. So if you take your writing seriously, Spend the time and money to educate yourself. Learn from those who are experienced and trust your intuition. So your exercise, if I knew I couldn't fail, I would. Pause the slideshow. Have a go at this. Another exercise for you around your due diligence is to research the following. Check out traditional publishing companies. Look at their submission guidelines carefully. Consider the boutique publishers as well as the big five. Um, look into some self-publishing services and compare. We'll, we'll share some companies in the Facebook um, group. Join writing organisations and attend events. Find out about editors and proofreaders and about their services. Check out literary agents and manuscript assessors. Check out book distributors. And, of course, write your book and your pictures and your proposal. And if all of this, and I wouldn't blame you at all, is feeling overwhelming... How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Resources. A decent proposal by Rhonda Whitten and Sheila Hollingworth. Self-publishing made simple. The ultimate Australian guide by Ewan Mitchell. The well-fed self-publisher by Peter Bowerman. That's supposed to say Bowerman. B-O-W-E-R-M-A-N. The Australian Writers Marketplace, which is produced by the Queensland Writers' Centre. Um, just make sure you get the latest edition of it. Join your state writer centre in the National Author Society for Industry Information and Legal Advice. So where are you up to in the writing process? What are your next steps? Are you feeling ready and equipped to progress your project on your own or would you appreciate some support, whether it's editing or feedback or more information or coaching for accountability? Um, what would you like from me? Another course like this, a subscription service, one-on-one -on -one attention um, I'd love to know. I'd love to know, obviously, what worked for you about this particular session and this course as a whole and what didn't work and how could it be improved. Stand by your, for your feedback survey as well. Thank you. Really appreciate you sharing this journey with me. I hope you found it rich and useful. Phew! There was a lot in that, wasn't there? Are you overwhelmed? So don't be. Remember, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time, with uh, an apology to elephants. Uh, it's a good analogy, though. So, wow, we're at the end. Before I sign off, here's a quick squeeze at a few of the books that I mentioned. Um, Self-Publishing Made Simple by Ewan Mitchell. Really excellent. As I said, we used this one. It was like a Bible for us as we were self-publishing The Mastery Club. Very handy. A Decent Proposal, How to Sell Your Book by um, Rhonda Witten and Sheila Hollingworth. Um, and this one, remember, even if you are opting to self-publish, it's really worth doing all of your exercises around pitching to publishers because it helps you crystallise your own thinking. 
and this is a very out-of-date version of the Australian Writers' Marketplace, but it's a real treasure trove, a real resource of publishers' contact details. This is why you need the up-to-date one, because the contact details will be all out-of-date now. Um, but, you know, all sorts of stuff, magazines, journals, um, book publishing, publishers, publishing services, how to get an agent, um, awards, writers, organisations, fellowships and grants and... Um, literary events and all sorts of stuff. It's, there's just masses of stuff in there. It's really worthwhile. So you'll receive a request for some feedback from me very soon so that I can keep improving this course. And meanwhile, I hope that you are now empowered, enriched, enthused, inspired and informed to go ahead and write and publish your magnificent book. Thank you for sharing the journey with me.